So uh, look at the, uh, the um, five choices there, okay? Which of these best describe fallen angels or demons? Number one, an evil person who has died. Number two, bikers who wear leather and chains. Three, disembodied spirits of a race of people who live before Adam. Number four, angelic beings that some were cast into hell and some of them were released on the earth during Satan's revolt. Number five, people who have died but they didn't make it to heaven or hell but now are in purgatory. Which one is that? Number four. Did everybody online get that too? Number four? Well, you got to have the handout to do that, but hopefully you had the time today to, to print that out and uh, pick that up. It is number four. Angelic beings that some were cast into hell and some of them were released on earth during Satan's revolt. So it's not uh, bikers who wear leather or chains. It's not disembodied spirits of a race of people that lived before Adam, and it definitely is not people who have died but didn't make it to heaven or hell but are now in purgatory, right? Are now in purgatory. Just not the case. So, um, all right. Well, in our Western culture, there's this cartoon uh, depiction of Lucifer or Satan. As this man dressed up in red tights, dark hair, mustache, goatee. Oh, he, that's right, he had a goatee, didn't he? Goatee was such a, was, was such a, a devilish uh, delusion about him and uh, usually a pitchfork. Um, and then you've got ball teams for all these different high schools and college teams, you got the red devils, you got the blue devils, you got the sun devils, and you have the philosophical metaphor for evil like the dark side, the force, man's dark side. And all have led to a lot of disbelief. How many, how, what do you think? Let me just throw it out there. How many, of you, how many of you here in-house and how many of you online? I want you to put a percentage number in here in a second. How many do, of you, um, if you were going to say what you think our culture believes now about Satan and the demonic, that they actually are beings that exist, that they are fallen angels, what do you think that number might be in um, surveys today. They wouldn't know that. Probably zero. It's not that low. What exactly is the question? The question is, what percentage of people do you believe believe, uh, believe that there is a, a devil and a, a demon that's actually a being? Hmm? 90% believe it? You think? Yeah. 30, 90. I heard zero a minute ago. Less than 50. Somebody, Alan, what are you saying in the booth? 20? Yeah. It depends on what survey you, you get. Uh, Barna has the lowest, and that's, that is about uh, 23 or 4%. Um, Pew Research is up about 40% uh, that believe there are beings such as de a devil, a person, a, a devil and demons. And uh, then there's some secular groups that it's, it's even lower than that. But nobody had zero, okay? But the more and more we get away from being a biblical Christian Judeo uh, culture um, as here in the United States, the lower all those numbers are going to be. I mean, just like we're seeing the numbers go down radically of those that claim to be Christians now. You know, it just continues to drop. While the number of the nuns, I'm N O N E S, as in they have no affiliation with God, with a religion, with a denomination, anything. 
continues to grow. It's now about 27, 28% of the United States population. So, uh, and that number has, I mean, it's shifted now probably about 13, 14% just in, in the last 10 years or so. So we've got um, some real shifts and declines going on in uh, our nation. We, we need the Lord. We need revival in his church. So it, it's definitely something that uh, needs to happen. Hey, uh, handouts are around the room and I wanna gra get you to grab some. Like I said, I've, I've been studying for the last couple of hours on the Nephilim, <laughs> thanks to Melissa. <laughs> Melissa's uh, asked me two or three questions about the Nephilim, and then we had some others that were, they're on demons. Uh, and I'm gonna start on those next week, but I knew we needed to get started tonight if we're gonna cover some ground on this study. The Bible isn't uh, ambiguous about Satan's reality. It tells us of Satan often. In fact, you can read in the scriptures where he is there tempting Eve, in Genesis chapter three, verse one, you can read also where he's inciting King David to take a uh, faithless census in first, first Chronicles chapter 21, verse one. Satan's there at the end of Revelation to do ba battle with the Lord's people. Jesus refers to Satan some 25 times in the four gospels as, uh, as a, a actual being and he talks about having a personal encounter with him in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 11 so Jesus identified him anytime Jesus clarifies something for us I'll, I'm always thankful because then we've got Jesus chiming in on that subject matter Satan's real the demonic is real um, I will, I will share with you some things that uh, are just from scripture tonight and we'll cover that. It was the uh, poet Dante that believed that Lucifer fell 20 seconds after creation. Others like Milton wrote that the angelic creation and fall were immediately before the temptation of Adam and Eve. Do you know those subjects really don't matter? Seriously. We can talk till we're blue in the face and, and we still won't know with certainty when Lucifer fell. Uh, we know it was prior to Adam and Eve. Biblically, we know that, right? You would think that it's somewhere back in time. But here's the reason we don't get, you know, the Bible tells us on, on uh, vain philosophies and things that are controversial and we can't settle it to not get caught up in those things. We need to deal with the majors and keep the majors in front of us and that's what we agree upon because that's how we get divided in the body of Christ. We get on all these topics and you might have an opinion, everybody's gonna have an opinion on something but, but they really don't matter. And uh, so I say that. I wanted to share Dante and uh, uh, Milton because they, they made that such a big deal, uh, you know, 150, 200 years ago. Um, so the important thing to ask is why did they fall? Why did the angels fall? Why did, why did Lucifer try to take the throne of God? That's the, that's the issue right there. That's the one to camp down on. So at first glance, Satan's schemes are seen in his biblical titles. So I want you to identify these. There's some fill-ins on all uh, 10 or 11, whatever, however many I got here. Uh, Satan means adversary. Satan means adversary. Fill in that blank, adversary. You see that in a couple passages, one Old Testament passage in Job and one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The devil's name, one of the meanings of his name, particularly in the book of 1 Peter 5, 8, is slander. Slander. It's L-A-N-D-E-R. Slander. Lucifer has many names in the Old Testament. I'm going to share a few here. One of them is uh, Lucifer means son of the morning 
or the shining one. Shining one is your fill in there, shining. Belzubab means Lord of the Flies. Isn't that a wonderful meaning for who you are? That you are Lord of filth, flies. I mean, is there anything more aggravating than flies? Dirty flies putting their little gummy junk on your windows and flying around, and especially when it's towards the end of summer and they're slow, right? And then they just buzz around you and, you know, you call them devils? Devil, devil, get out of here. Yeah, devil. <laughs> well, they're irritating, aren't they? Um, Lord of the Flies, Belzubab. Biel is one that means name of a false god. Let me make sure I got my phone down here. Might be my tablet. Okay, surely I got it now. So, uh, Biel means the name, a name of a false god. Second Corinthians five, uh, chapter six, verse fifteen. The evil one. You've heard Satan called that. In fact, he's mentioned that way several times. But in First John chapter five, verse nineteen, I'll draw attention to that. It's the word for absolute, absolute corruption in the Greek text. Absolute corruption. Think about that. Absolute corruption, not partially corrupt, not mostly corrupt, absolute corruption. The tempter, First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 15, the tempter, he's called that in other spots too. The prince of this world, John chapter 12, verse 31, and the accuser of the brethren, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And the sisters don't think for a second he's not the accuser of the cistern too. Is that a word? You just coined it. It's a word in King James. Sister. I'm feeling playful tonight, so play with me, all right? Um, let me share with you some key verses, and let's just stop and have prayer together. Father, bless our study tonight. Pray that... Father, there will be many joined us online. We thank you for uh, the group that's, that's growing in-house. We pray that you just really uh, speak to us. Lord, help me just to, to uh, lead this uh, Bible study tonight in a way that's pleasing to you and helpful to our people and those uh, online as well. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to look at a couple of undeniable truths about Satan and the fallen angels. These are very basic truths about, uh, the de about demons. So um, one of them uh, is that Satan and demons are those who rebelled. So let's go to a passage. It's one of the ones I mentioned up here. In fact, uh, these two key passages that you have up there in the, the bar above that. But if you would go to this passage found in the book of Ezekiel. <coughs> These are two very primary passages about understanding the fall of Satan. So look at this. In verse 12, he says, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were a model of perfection. I want you to hear the description of, of Lucifer of Satan before he's, he becomes Satan. You were a model of perfection. Think about that. You've got it all. You have, you've fully arrived. You've, you've got everything. Listen to the rest of this. Full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Now I know we don't normally think of um, uh, names associated in, in male, um, as, as being beautiful. But I, I did hear a young lady not too many years ago tell me that Brad Pitt was a beautiful man. <laughs> I did hear them say that. Yeah, so he got, <laughs> we got a man admitting Brad Pitt's a beautiful man. All right, so there you go. You were a model of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He's everything he could have ever hoped to be. 
He's maximized. He is arrived in the kingdom of God and has a high, high position. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Isn't that a big giveaway here? You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, uh, sapphire, um, turquoise, beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day that you were created. They were prepared. So it's a created being we're hearing described. In verse 14, you were anointed a as a guardian cherubim. We mentioned this when we started the study because often people will talk about Satan as an archangel. So we're told here that he was a guardian cherubim. So I ordained you. Listen to the language of God's description here. You are on the holy mount of God. You're in heaven yourself, yourself is what we're hearing. You're perfect. You're beautiful. You're wise. You have all this going for you and you have this anointed position. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the days you were created until wickedness was found in you. Through the widespread trade, uh, trade you were filled with violence and you did what? Sin. Sinned. The angels are in a state of, of perfection, sinlessness there in the kingdom of heaven. He, he had to choose this, just like we chose. Even though we've been born with the sin nature, we have no choice there. We will sin because we have a sin nature, right? But we all still choose sin. And if you were Adam and Eve, don't come back saying that you wouldn't have sinned. You wouldn't have eaten that fruit. You would have you absolutely would have, you would have failed as well. Um, I had one lady tell me one time, well, I wouldn't have eaten it. My husband would have had to eat it first and then I would have eaten it. And I said, liar, no. Love y'all, okay? We, listen, it would, have, it would have played out the same with anybody. They were perfect people. They were perfect, okay? So, your heart became proud, an account of your beauty, uh, on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Had it all, had it all, and threw it all away. So, I did what? God says, I threw you to the earth and made a spectacle of you before kings. That is... Such an incredible passage about the fall of Lucifer, of how he became Satan. Uh, and you see what was in his heart. It tells us that he sinned. And he says, I, I, uh, I somehow I'm, I skipped a couple of verses, didn't I? Did I jump over something there? Yeah. In the mount of God and I expelled you. I, I don't think I read that a moment ago. So anyway, um, well, I wanted to touch on that. So fill in that blank up above there that simply says Satan and the demons are those who rebelled. Now, let's add to this passage the one that's found in Isaiah chapter 14. It's another very key passage about uh, demonology in the, in the Old Testament. And I want you to really focus in on the five I will statements. So there's five of them, all right? I will. I want you to hear the arrogance and the pride. What does God always tell us? You know, when, when people, uh, we've got to be careful about this. We're under the Lord and nothing happens unless he allows us to do that, right? So, you know, we're so quick to say tomorrow I'm going to go so-and-so where place in the morning. I'm going to eat lunch at this place with so-and-so. And that may be on your calendar, I'm going to go here in the afternoon and then I'm doing these things and I'm going to meet with so-and-so at the end of the day and uh, we're, I'm, my wife, and we're going to dinner at such and such place. And next thing you, next thing you know, you, you have literally said everything you're going to do 
And what does God tell us to say? It's, there's a little phrase found in the book of 1 John chapter 5, and I try to add it in my speech with my plans. If the Lord wills, or if the Lord, Lord's willing, right? And people, people may think you're a little crazy because you say that, but if you're under the Lordship of Christ, your, your every day is under his command, and he could shift your day at any given moment. Listen to the pride of Lucifer here. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 down to 15. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Oh my gosh, what arrogance. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly and on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the cloud. And then listen to this statement. The last I will. I will make myself like the most high. I'm taking over. I'm going to be God. I'm so beautiful. I'm so powerful. I'm so strong. I'm taking over heaven. You are full of yourself when you say those kind of things, aren't you? Was Lucifer full of himself? Was he arrogant, full of pride? He thought he was something else. Boy, oh boy, was he going to find out differently. When you step into the boxing ring with God, you remember Job did that? Job kept saying, I haven't sinned, and he hadn't. He was correct. But he kept wanting to justify himself. His pride was getting the best of him. He kept wanting to be justified. We all want to, don't we? Job, um, such an incre just an incredible book. I've preached through it about three or four times, and the staff thinks I'm, I'm going to be preaching through it in the fall because I keep talking about it. If I do, it's going to be a series I'm going to call When All Hell Comes Against You. I, I want to tell you something. I love that book. I just think it's so powerful. It's so powerful. And uh, I would love, Lord willing, <laughs> and the creek don't rise. I'll have, add an Appalachian phrase. All right? I've been wanting to say that for like five minutes. <laughs> and the creek don't rise, baby, right? Uh, I'll add that Appalachian phrase from, from back home. Uh, but I didn't hear that, but I, no. Okay. You, <laughs> listen to this. I will ascend above the tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. Mm. Gee whiz. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Anybody, you, like, let's go back to that Job example. Job kept saying, I want my day in court. I want to just, I want to be justified. I want God to declare that. And he got in the ring with God and God threw 77 punches at him and he didn't come back with one. 77 questions, Job couldn't answer one of them. Bam, 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 bam. You just don't get in the ring with God and come out the winner. You're going to get busted up. You're going down to the depths of the pit. Like Satan. When Lucifer is quite the villain in the Old Testament and the New Testament, so I want you to look at a passage in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. It says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. That all-inspired book of Jude put it this way in verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. So, this rebellion that Lucifer had, we know that he took a third of the angels that 
fell with him. So I want to take you to some verses that speak to some of those matters as well. So again, you'll see a black bar there on your handout, and we've got several scripture passages. They start, start with Luke 8, Luke 10, Mark 5, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, which I just shared that one with you. But I want you to look at these with me, and I'll go to the passage. Um, in fact, I'll go to a little more lengthy passage. Let's go to Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 28 and read down to verse 33. So let's look at that passage. This is New Testament. I want you to see the interaction with demons in the New Testament versus the old and see uh, the contrast, is there, if there is any. He says, when, Jesus, uh, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. Verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? Listen to this answer, Legion. And then it explains to us, he had replied because many demons had gone into him. This man was not demon-possessed. He was demon-possessed, plural. Many demons had possessed this man. Uh, why in the world is he showing such strength? And he begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons, plural, begged Jesus to let them go into them. And he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and, were, and was drowned. So you have this man. This man that's possessed by demons that are simply named Legion because there's many of them. He... Uh, you read the description about him, how he couldn't be chained. If he was chained, hand and foot, kept under guard, he broke out. And then he would go to these solitary places. Now, we read of some other demon accounts that Jesus interacted with that are very similar type stories. So I want you to look at something with me, and that is this. We're going to, uh, this part, I'm going to just basically just do a little quick summation uh, because you can take these scriptures and look these up yourself. And I want to encourage you to do so. Um, with the history of Satan and the demons, we start in the Old Testament. So look at this. Uh, in the book of Exodus, the um, Egyptian music magicians that were able to do things uh, such as... Uh, matching some of the things that Moses did in front of them, uh, where snakes appeared and where other miracles appeared. Where in the world did that power come from? Is God doing it? I mean, this is something you always need to think kind of past what you're reading and don't do a surface reading, but think about how, how is this manifesting itself? You've got, you've got God and, and Satan on, on display in these passages, don't you? You see the demonic in action. How did these miracles, these were real, these were real miracles that were taking place right there in front of Moses. And, and the Egyptians, what, how did this happen? Satan gave you the power. Yeah, he did. You see, a lot of times people will tell me about things that they've seen or heard or experienced. And I, I don't doubt that because I do believe Satan will, um, he's a counterfeit. 
he will imitate what the things that God does. But his number is 666, God's number is seven. He's the full number of, of godly completion, right? Satan always comes up a little short, right? And that's the way it is. But that passage in Exodus 7 is a very interesting passage in that regard. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, just make a reference to that. Verse 14, that's the passage where Saul has an evil spirit enter him. Well, what is an evil spirit? It's a demon, yes. Now, remember something about Old Testament believers. The Holy Spirit of God didn't reside in us, why? Because of the sin factor, it had not been removed. It's not removed until the New Testament when, when Jesus Christ bleeds, uh, his blood is, covers our sin, he dies in our place, he's resurrected, then the Bible tells us that on the day of Pentecost, the disciples had already received the Spirit of God just prior to that, but they, on the day of Pentecost, all the other believers received what? They received the Holy Spirit of God. Everybody else at conversion thereafter, read Romans chapter eight, it says if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not the Lord's. You don't have Jesus Christ. If you have Jesus Christ, guess what? You have the Holy Spirit, right? That's an important theological statement to understand. God gives us the Holy Spirit at conversion, doesn't he? And then how much the Spirit of God controls us is, is a big deal. The reason I bring that up is this evil spirit enters Saul. What did Saul do after this evil spirit entered him? Well, he did several things, but throw them out there. Do you remember? He tried to kill David, God's chosen servant to, to take his place. He didn't even, he didn't know this yet, right? Wasn't full, fully revealed and all that. He pursued him after he did know that to try to kill him. But you remember he, he threw a spear across the room and tried to spear David? After what? An evil spirit had entered him. Now, in the Old Testament, anybody would have been vulnerable to an evil spirit because they didn't have the protection of the Holy Spirit, right? So think about that. It doesn't, you know, Saul had his problems and he didn't give God his total obedience and God's judgment finally fell upon him. But David was the anointed king to take, take his place, right? Not his son, uh, Jonathan. So you remember those stories, but it tells us that an evil spirit entered him. You can read also in Psalm 106, we've already covered this, about how there are people in other worship of other gods, they think have sacrificed even their children. They have actually done child sacrifices of their own children to Satan and to demons. Isn't that something? That's what all other gods are, huh? Let's look at number two, Satan and demons in the New Testament. Matthew chapter four. What is in Matthew chapter four? It's that passage where Jesus has this encounter with, with Lucifer. He has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. His body is physically depleted. He's been in prayer all that time. Satan comes at him, offers him first what? Yeah, well, well, first he offered him what? He offered him food, yeah. He started with food. And then he does offer him the world uh, that if you'll just bow down to me, you, you, don't have, you don't have to go die for all these people. You don't have to suffer and be humiliated. I mean, see, Jesus knew where he was going. I mean, he wrote the book. He knows what's coming. He knows what he's going. Why does he pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Lord, if there's another way, 
and this could pass from me. Let it be, but not my will, but yours. You see a very human moment of Jesus in that passage, don't you? And I tend to focus in on Jesus on his um, divinity side. I do. I think most preachers do. Um, but we've got to remember he was fully man, right? And that, that's a moment it really shows up, doesn't it? Look at this. There are a number of other, of other passages here, and I'm going to just reference those uh, for you and ask that you give those a, a really, really uh, good reading. Uh, the passage in Mark chapter 5 is an extraordinary passage, so give that careful eye there. Um, well, they're all extraordinary passages, amen? But I, I get a lot out of uh, demonic, uh, of demonic theology out of Mark chapter uh, 5. He really, um, God just gave him a great word about that. So let me just go to this third um, uh, area, and we'll just talk about Satan and demons in the church age. So these are all post-gospel, okay? So it's the book of Acts, it's the letters, uh, and you'll see that uh, the references are to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And these are all uh, about demon involvement and activity in, in the church. Now, I've got a question for you, okay? I want you to ponder this. Let's ponder together, okay? I told you I'm in a playful mood today, all right? But let's ponder this. If there are angels, like in the seven churches of Revelation, chapter two and three, the seven physical churches that were in Asia Minor, um, we know that the Bible says that this was, it, it identifies that all those churches had an angelic presence. There was an, their angel. We've talked about angels as being um, guardian angels assigned to you from conception on uh, in your life. And I believe in that. I believe that there's scriptures that, that confirm that. We've talked about that already. Um, do churches have angels? We talked about this earlier, but I want to know what you think. You believe they do? Obviously, the Holy Spirit is our primary uh, need in, in the body of Christ. But, you know, God's a very thorough God, isn't he? He always does things and he covers, he, he, he does it in a, um, it's, it's always more than enough, isn't it? It's always uh, sufficient and, and beyond. He's, he's this God that is given, he, he blesses us with abundance often, doesn't he? More, more than we deserve and more than we need. But at least always what you need, right? Fair enough? So are there angels in churches? Okay, so you're saying your guardian angel's sitting there. Is he, is he between you and Leo, or is he on the other side? Oh, he's between me and you. <laughs> That's a pretty good one. Uh, he's between me and you, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so you, you say absolutely. I do too, but I wish we could see him. Yeah? Okay. Yeah? You must clarify one thing. They're not in all churches. Because not all churches follow the Bible the way we do. You see what I'm saying? You're about to say church. Church covers a lot of things. Yeah. But, but could there be an angel assigned even to churches that are not obedient churches? Maybe a demon. Maybe a demon. I mean, they would be even more needed, right? Okay. I, I know you online can't hear all this because they're not mic'd up. But 
we're, we're talking about angels in the church and uh, there's lots of folks in the room saying, yeah, yeah we've got our guardian angels and uh, but between us right here and <laughs> we've got our guardian angels that are uh, sitting here with us or present with us. Uh, we do have that record in Revelation 2 and 3, and I, I, I take it literal. I don't take it as figurative. Uh, we know the Spirit is what matters most about the church, that it's the Spirit of God that accomplishes all things through his obedient people, right? So we got one statement here about maybe angels aren't assigned to bad churches, okay? Okay. Not, not what? Oh, oh, here's where I was going. Thank you, Candy. I appreciate that. Candy said, maybe not good angels, such as fallen angels. Hmm. You know, in, in 2018, in the fall, it was about, in, in fact, I... I, I wasn't going to share that story tonight, but I think I'll go ahead and share it. Um, there was a lady that came up to me after the service was over, and I had been your pastor for about a year, right, right at a year. And we were getting ready to go on a mission trip. We were having a mission emphasis that day, and one of the things we were focusing on was the mission trip to Mexico. So... This little lady came up, and I had preached that day on the widow's might. She came forward and told me that she, too, is a widow and that she was very moved. She was a senior adult. She's a very small lady. In fact, she reminded me a lot of, uh, um, of Mary Ella. She was that type of build, very small, petite woman. Um, and she opened up her little billfold. And she said, I, I'm really, really poor, have very little money, but God impressed me to give what I have. And she took something out. I couldn't see it. I was trying not to be nosy, you know. I was looking up and she put something in my hand and she closed my hand. Well, I waited till she kind of got a little bit past me and she was almost at the door and I opened my hand and there was 22 cents, two dimes and two pennies. Now, I've been around for a year and I feel like I know the church pretty good now. There's some names I still don't know, but I'm, I, know, I know our people. I'd never seen this lady before. And she said something very strange when she started to walk off. When she folded my hand, she said, I'm giving my all. That's all I've got until I get more help. That is going to be magnified many times over. I'm telling you, that's what will happen. God is going to magnify this and multiply this gift. You watch and see. She smiled, walked away. Very happy, very jovial person, you know. So I asked Wayne Lee, has he ever seen that woman before? And he told me, he said, maybe, I'm not sure. I don't know who she is, but maybe I've seen her once, twice here before. I, I don't know. That Monday night, I went to a leadership council meeting. I told them the story of the 22 cents I had in my hand. I walked out of the leadership meeting with 500 and some dollars because they were moved to give. I went to a deacon's meeting a couple weeks later, told them the story of the 22 cents, and we were trying to raise money for the trip to Mexico. And I showed them the 22 cents, told them about it. And I walked out of the room that night with about another $2,000. About a week later, another deacon comes to me and said, God just really moved in my heart about this. And 
that deacon and his wife had a check for $3,000. I never even came to the church with this story, just in those leadership groups. Well, and then I came to the box, I think it was the next day, wasn't it, Gary? I came into, I opened the drawer the, the first day, and there was $22 laying in my drawer. I mean, this just kept multiplying. Anyway, we had money for scholarships for everybody that wanted to, to go with, to Mexico that couldn't go unless they had some help. And, and things were thin right then for us as a church. And we had about $55,000, $6,000 given on that word, lady's word. That lady has never been here since. Now, who was that? She could have been an angel. She could have been. She could have been a little lady. It's just a faith walker and walks around and blesses people and gives 22 cents everywhere she goes, you know? I'm telling you, I believe that was another angelic encounter I, I've had. And, you know, I, I told Wayne, I said, Wayne, you know her? You know, he, he's been around here for eons, right? Almost. Almost. Oh, a good while. He, he had never seen her. I asked some other people, no. I had a bunch of people go, what woman are you talking about? I didn't see any woman. <laughs> I didn't see her. Now, what do you make of that? Could she have been a bodily form of an angel that's here at the Oaks? I'm not going to get heavy on that one because I, I feel much stronger about Gloria in Canada that she was an angel. But I'm telling you, I have no explanation about that woman. And nobody knew her. Nobody's seen her. She never told me her name. She told me she was a widow lady and that she had no money. You guys in the booth, what do you think? Possibility, okay. All right, that's, okay. That was a Kimma answer right there. Might have been, might have been. That's right, with God all things are possible. Amen, brother. You redeemed your answer right there. All right, <laughs> I'm not picking. I'm not picking on you, Alan. I, like I said, I'm just in a playful mood tonight, all right? So anyway, I, I uh, just will share that with you all. Um, I'm going to share with you a couple of demon stories that I've encountered. And one of them, man, I mean, it was, um, it was just unreal. Um, it was on a mission trip in Brazil that I was on when I was 27 years old. And uh, it's, it's the first time I was involved in an exorcism, an actual exorcism. And uh, we were thrust into it. There was no choice. You had to deal with it. But I will share that these next, uh, this next week or two. All right. So those of you in this room, a question for you. If we have Bible study next Wednesday, it's spring break. Will you be here in town that you would come? Or are you going someplace next week? Here? Here? Here. Here? Okay. We're just trying to survey because, you know, sometimes we call that week off. And I've already had people tell me, why do you take a break now when the youth and the children do on spring break? Because we still are at home and we'd like to, to check it, you know, check into that. So anyway, we got a lot of folks uh, checking out the, the Angel series. So we'll go ahead and have 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 Bible study next next Wednesday okay I know the youth are going to meet too uh, this next week because they were the youth were requesting because so many of them are not traveling anywhere with with the COVID stuff so anyway um, they had asked if uh, Austin if they could meet so we'll do the same we'll be here next week and we'll cover some some more in fact I'll I'll tell you uh, a demon story or two and uh, man I mean it is, is just unreal what God did. So um, anyway, we'll uh, cover those. L um, let me see where we are. We are, I can look at my tablet and that'll tell me a little better. Roman number two. So it is 721. Let's, 
Let's uh, go ahead and I will just mention the, uh, yeah, let's just stop there, okay? And we'll, um, I knew I wasn't going to finish this study tonight anyway. So when, this one's got a lot, of, a lot of material. And we'll try to answer some of those questions next couple of weeks as well so that uh, people have turned in. It's funny to me that we got a lot more questions on demons than we did on angels. So that's uh, interesting to me. Um, so this shows how, how those things draw our attention, uh, doesn't it? So, hey, we're going to go ahead and sign off a little early tonight, 722. Um, and uh, God bless you for joining us online. And you're sure welcome to join us. We'll do the other half of this study next week and get that covered along with some questions. So we will break a little early tonight. And thank you for joining us.